Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. So, it's the 4th of July today, the day that this vlog is coming out, and I wanted to talk to you about something related to the freedom of the United States of America. <laughs> that actually has everything to do with Bright Line Eating. So, um, a couple weeks ago, the European Congress on Obesity took place in Vienna. And at that Congress, which was peer-reviewed, meaning scientists had to um, sort of approve the papers that were presented there, um, some Danish researchers presented new aggregate analyses of World Health Organization data that talked about the trends of obesity in the world. And what they showed is that at the current rates, by 2045, about a quarter of people in the world will be obese. Not overweight, but obese. And in the United States, um, I don't know if you are aware of the stats, the numbers that I've been sharing forever and ever and ever and ever are one third, one third, one third, that one third of Americans are obese, uh, one third are overweight, and one third are normal weight. Those numbers aren't accurate anymore. Um, more than one third of Americans in present day today are obese. It's now 39% of Americans are obese. And according to these projections, by 2045, 55% of Americans are going to be obese. Not overweight, obese. 55%. In England, it's going to be 48% and growing, growing, growing around the world. And um, this report in particular warned of the staggering health consequences and financial consequences as diabetes in particular and um, cancer and heart disease and stroke and Alzheimer's and all of these diseases that are impacted by the foods that we eat and the weight that we carry on our body um, are gonna be overwhelming health systems around the world. So, if you'd heard, I think there was one little tiny report a few years ago that said, oh, the obesity you know, epidemic is stalling out. Uh, it's not true. <laughs> uh, the numbers are, are getting worse, as I'm sure you suspected. So how this relates to American freedom is that, you know, it's, it's kind of our uh, American way that helped get us into this pickle in the first place. Um, American way being you know, nobody's gonna tell us anything and we're gonna do what we wanna do, right? And we also have this, you know, business system, this sort of free market enterprise that um, has rewarded companies for selling us foods that are addictive to us, right? And that we can't get enough of. And it's not legal and it's not in those companies' best interests for them to um, stop making money off of our palates, you know, the foods that we love to eat. When I, when I say it's not legal, what I mean is that those companies, as most of them, the big ones are publicly traded companies, um, they're legally beholden to maximize profits for their shareholders. That's actually what they need to do from a legal perspective. And so to the uh, extent that we all buy those foods and we want those foods and we demand those foods and we eat those foods and we love those foods, to that extent, it's actually their fiduciary responsibility to manufacture those foods for us and to be on the front lines of making the next morsel even tastier, to hit that bliss point even more powerfully um, so that we can't get enough and we will buy more and buy more and buy more. And so we also in America live in this culture where um, we bristle at the thought of our government curtailing our freedoms. You know, I don't believe that any kind of solution is going to come from government mandates or regulations. I would support them. Like I think, for example, having a hefty soda tax is a really good idea, the same way we have now hefty cigarette taxes. Um, but any kind of legislation that would really do any good, it's going to cross the line of what Americans feel comfortable with, in my opinion, right? What this leaves us with is the necessity for a solution to come from the individuals, from the masses, from people deciding that we're fed up and that we don't wanna be buying that food anymore. 
And because so many of us are addicted, it's going to create, it's going to necessitate an entire change in the way that we conceive of the foods that we eat. Uh, so many people are going to have to stop buying those foods and start buying these foods in order to make a real dent in what the companies manufacture for us and our food environment in general. It's a big deal. 55% of Americans are going to be obese by 2045. We're about to basically bankrupt ourselves with the foods that we're eating. And so on this 4th of July, um, I thought I'd share with you in a nutshell, just distilled down to the essence, what I think is gonna have to happen for things to change. I think what's gonna have to happen is we're gonna have to start thinking of food really, really differently on a societal level, the same way that we think of cigarettes differently. So if you go back to, I don't know if you saw the movie Forrest Gump, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. If you haven't seen it, that's okay. The scene that really resonates with me related to this discussion is at the beginning of the movie, little young Forrest, he's maybe 10 years old or something, he's got like a crooked spine and crooked legs and his legs need to be in a brace and the doctor is treating him and like securing braces for his legs, these big metal things. And the doctor is treating little Forrest Gump with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Like the doctor is talking to the mom, this is in the South, right, in Greenbow, Alabama, in the probably 1950s or something. And the doctor's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth while he is working with a child patient. And you know, fast forward today, that would never, ever, ever happen right? We have come so far in our society, in our conception of cigarettes and cigarette smoke and secondhand smoke. When I was a little kid, there was smoking on airplanes. Like you were trapped <laughs> in the air with people smoking cigarettes near you. Um, yeah. And there was smoking in restaurants and there was, you know, it was a whole different world back then, you know. Um, today, cigarette smoke has taken its rightful place in our cultural understanding as a toxin, as a poison, as a filthy habit, as an addictive habit, and something that people are free to do, but over there, please, right? And I think what's gonna have to change in our society to get out of this mess that we've made for ourselves, that we are making for ourselves, that's getting worse and worse and worse, is exactly that kind of shift. We're gonna to have to start thinking of processed manufactured foods, all of that junk food made out of sugar and flour and all that, those combinations of sugar, flour, salt, fat in bags with packages, with long labels, with ingredients that none of us understand. We're gonna to have to start thinking of that food as poison, as toxins, as something that people are free to partake of, but over there, please while the rest of us eat whole real food that grows out of the ground and that is sold in the perimeter of the grocery store, you know, mostly in the produce section. And um, it's gonna have to start to feel to us, uh, advertising of those foods to kids is gonna have to start to feel like advertising of cigarettes to kids. Um, in the same way that we wouldn't let our kids play with those old um, candy cigarettes that, you know, they used to have candy cigarettes for kids to practice smoking when they were seven years old, right? We're going to have to start thinking of kids' restaurant menus with nothing but mac and cheese and pizza and stuff, right, on the kids' menus like that. Like, it would be so repulsive to just offer a kid a menu filled with that kind of junk that's going to cause their them to be obese and have type 2 diabetes as it would be to give them a pack of fake cigarettes candy cigarettes for christmas or something so we have a big shift to make um and i think that the core features of this new way of thinking are that these processed foods made out of sugar and flour are addictive. That not everyone is equally susceptible. So if you don't struggle with that addiction, you can't judge that and say, oh, come on, it's not addictive. It's your brain is reacting okay, but other people's brains get powerfully addicted. So we're gonna have to globally, collectively understand 
that different brains respond differently to food addiction, right? And then we're gonna have to work together to create an environment where it's safe for people to quit. The people who really need to quit, who can't moderate, who need to quit, we're gonna need to understand that that's not extreme. What's extreme is going blind from type two diabetes when you know it's coming. What's extreme is getting your chest cavity broken, broken open and having open heart surgery because you just had a heart attack. Those things are extreme. Quitting sugar and flour is not extreme. It's necessary. It's like quitting smoking for the percentage of us that are profoundly affected by these drugs that are in our system. That's, that's basically it. Foods are addictive, not equally to all people. And for those of us who are addicted, we need to quit. And we need to create an environment where that's safe for people to quit and not be harassed because we wanna quit using our drugs. And it's gonna take a lot, I think, for that to happen. We are just at the itty bitty 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 nascent beginnings of this transformation. And um, I don't know what it's gonna take to get there. What might happen is that we start bankrupting ourselves collectively as a human society. And then maybe those of us in bright line eating who are living happy, thin and free, who used to be obese and who aren't anymore or used to struggle with food and don't anymore, we will be there when people are looking around and saying, what can we do about this? Is there any population of people that's having any success? And we'll be over there in the corner saying, we are, we are, here's what we're doing differently. Maybe it'll go like that, I'm not sure. But I do know that with this American diet that we've now exported and turned into the global industrial diet and with the impact that it's having now around the world and given our values of freedom and free enterprise and the fact that you know those companies are still making a lot of money selling that stuff, and, and as they should, that's their fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders, right? Given all that, the change is gonna have to come from us. It's gonna have to come from us. If we start turning the tide, maybe in 2045, 55% of Americans won't be obese, maybe. We'll see, I hope to live that long to see for myself. And I hope to keep doing this Bright Line Eating thing we have a goal here at Bright Line Eating to have 1 million people living in a right size body by 2030. Um, I hope you're on board for that and I can't wait to see what the next chapter brings. I'll see you next week.